Hello, welcome back. Sunday afternoon. Thanks for checking in. Um, I know I'm overdue for a book reading video. I'm sorry. I will get to it. I just keep getting distracted by my crazy dreams. So if you want to hear about some crazy dreams, um, keep listening. Uh, yeah, these were as out there as usual. Um, the second one, well, the last one I'll tell you about is, is was pretty spiritual. It was pretty cool. Um, last night's was more of the epic, strange, cosmic variety. So I got my notes here, and I'll just jump right in. Um, so, the one last night took place somewhat in the future. Maybe not the distant future. Maybe, I don't know, say like maybe in a few hundred years. It was a more te technologically advanced uh, Earth that I was on. And... Um, we had warp drive, we had spaceships, we had that kind of stuff. And um, it turned out that Earth was in trouble, in peril. Um, the sun was apparently dying, which doesn't make sense because um, actually the sun should burn for another 5 billion years. Um, so why it was going to go nova in just a few hundred, I can't say. But perhaps it was just symbolic anyway, as you'll see, as the dream evolves. So um, Earth was being abandoned for a new planet. And people were try trying to get to the spaceships um, that would take them to the new planet. And I think he, we even had to, like, warp drive there, you know, like advanced anti-gravity propulsion that supposedly aliens have already mastered. So I was trying to get to a ship um, that was in orbit above Earth. and I, But I was also um, entrusted with seeing that an older female leader um, be, make sure, make, I was entrusted to, I was entrusted with her like security, I guess you could say. Excuse me. So I had to make sure that she got um, to the ship and um for safe passage but she was a little screwy in the head <laughs> so she actually either intentionally or accidentally sabotaged the plan they had given us all these instructions for um like first we had to get into spacesuits and then how did this how did this work it's a little confusing so pardon me if if all the details don't exactly line up but that's how dreams are they don't always they don't always uh, obey total logic so um yeah we but first we were like in spacesuits um in order to get to the the ship which was in orbit now i don't know why it didn't you know like launch from the ground or something logical like that but that's just how it was and so this woman, she kind of screwed it up, and um, she essentially took off without me. And I ended up being stuck in a spacesuit floating above Earth, knowing that the sun was about to go, and um, no ship. So I was like, oh, wow. Like, this is it. I'm done. And I... I can't tell you how strange it was to be looking down back at Earth. And I was kind of like afraid to look at it. Like I didn't want to freak out too badly up there. But um, eventually I kind of like finally turned my head and then I could see the sun too in the distance. But the sun was really hazy. There was something very strange about it anyway. Um so like slightly off to my right and then when i fully like turned then i could see past all of it and i could see in that direction like a whole field of stars but off to the left it was like there was almost like nothing very strange i don't know what that's about doesn't again doesn't make logical sense but when i did turn to look a little more towards like what was way out there, I saw that the woman who who was uh, I was supposed to be taking care of the female leader, she was like 
she was sort of stuck in a metal satellite. There was a white metal satellite wheel. It kind of looked like the one from 2001 A Space Odyssey, if you've ever seen it. Like it was like a, a pinwheel. And she was just planted in it. She was like, her arms were outstretched. And like, that was like, she didn't, she didn't make it to the ship either. She screwed it up. And she was, she was already dead. I presumed. Because she wasn't moving. It's like she was frozen in space. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'm like, okay, well, this is it. And, um, the sun goes Nova and I closed my eyes real tight and I, you know how, when you can, when you have your eyes closed, but you can, you can see, you know, you can see it getting brighter, um, like if say the sun comes out from behind a cloud, like you've had your eyes closed, so you you can tell that there's brightness around you, um, but you don't actually see it with your eyes. That's a very poor explanation. But so the light was intensifying, even though my eyes were closed, and the heat was intensifying, and I um, I was like, wow, it's getting really warm, and then it kept getting warmer, but I wasn't like nothing was happening and. And I was wondering, well, uh, hopefully this will just be quick and not like drawn out and painless, but I didn't really know. And then for reasons unknown, I was catapulted through space. Um, instead of burning up, it's like I got pushed by the pushed by the by the force of the waves of uh, you know, uh, the energy. Being expelled by the sun, it, it, it doesn't make sense. But again, instead of dying, I, I got pushed. And I kind of like my body went into like kind of a warp and I ended up. Oh, the squirrels are outside on the tree running around chasing each other. Um, I ended up near the new planet that everybody was going to, the new Earth, which is kind of how they were referring to it. And I even like recall like being above that planet and contacting like some kind of support system of uh like space technicians to be like okay well how do i like i'm 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 up here in orbit how do i get down to the planet can you help me and they did they helped me get get from the new planet orbit down to the planet so i had i had succeeded i had made it And New Earth, we'll call it New Earth, looked a lot like um, Old Earth, but it but it had futuristic aspects too, like the coffee shakes, and um, eh, not so bad. Um, so I was in a I was in a city, some kind of city, I presume on the East Coast, maybe like a New York kind of city, but of course it was not New York because New York was gone, but a new a new New York, um, and one of the ways in which this civilization um, communicated was there was a lot of um, videos and messages and um, lights and things projected onto the sky. Like you could look up in the sky. I've had this before in dreams. I presume that it could be a reality on this earth someday that they could have it advertising in space they'll figure out how to how to do mass projections onto the sky which is a horrible thought of the sky being polluted by advertising but i think it'll probably happen because that's just how we are here everything gets commercialized you know because people worry about the number of satellites um obscuring our ability to see the stars someday like as more more and brighter satellites are put into earth's orbit um they look more like stars themselves and they also can obscure our view <laughs> uh you know humanity what are you gonna do so um but one of the things they were advertising and i was like watching this um it was kind of it, it almost looked like you didn't see the screen but it behaved like a screen like like it actually like there was a message on this on this thing, and it and it kind of turned towards me so that I could see it, but I, you could see it from behind. But then when it turned to face me, I realized I was looking at 
um, a projection of like an American flag in space. And I think I made a note about that. Let's see. Well, um, oh yeah, I had, I had wrote that when the sun went Nova, I was, um, shot through the shot through space like a bullet and made it to new earth um there weren't that many people on new earth yet it was underpopulated it was a rebuilding stage and so this flag for the united states that was projected on the sky it had like spots for all 50 states like you could see the outline of 50 stars but only 13 stars were lit and most of them were in the northeast and north and I thought that was interesting because I believe that didn't the original American flag have only 13 stars um, on it for the original 13 states, colonies? Um, and they were talking about it being year one. They weren't using uh, the current. Uh, hey, buddy, come on up. Shay's here. They weren't using the current Roman calendar system anymore. Um, it, you know, like instead of it being, say, 2054, 21, 2154, some futuristic year, now it was year one. It was, it was a new beginning, which, again, I think is symbolic more than literal. And so it was a new America on, on new earth in year one. And they were even talking about how they had to start we had to start over again at year one because of i don't remember how they refer to it but something like the betrayal of the nation or the end of the nation as we knew it and then it sounded like they were referring to the years of 45 like that we're experiencing now so even though this was the future it was still like representative of now that's why, again, I just think it's more symbolic than literal. I mean, it's all, it's all symbolic anyway because it's all, you know, ab abstract and ridiculous in the first place. Um, so I thought that was like symbolic of current events. And then I met President Biden. Um, he was there. He was, he was on the street. And um, we took a walk together. We walked for several blocks and he was old and frail, but he was up to the task. Um, and he was leading us there in year one. Again, the timeline doesn't make sense. But um, I took that, again, as a symbolic representation that maybe in some sense after the next election, maybe 2025 is really year one. It's It's a restart. Maybe... We're going into Aquarius and the MAGA age may begin to be on its way out, deservedly so. This fascist movement that has to be, um, has to be defeated. And, um, and that's how I learned about year one maybe i already said this because they were broadcasting it on the video screens in the sky they were saying talking about the year one celebration and i don't remember the specifics of of what president biden and i talked about as we were walking down the street but just to the fact that he was there and we were chatting so casually it's just like important that he was there like symbolically and then we we got to an intersection then he's like well i gotta go do my thing and then he walked off by himself. He just walked the other direction. And I went to, I think I went to a bar. And I was trying to figure out the new money. Because the new money was funny. Funny money. It worked differently. And uh, I had a couple drinks at this bar. And it was kind of festive but subdued. Um, yeah. And again, when I saw the projection of the American flag on the sky as I was, as I was standing there on the street and the 13 stars that were lit up, like I think where New York would be on, 
on the map. They were kind of laid out like the map of the United States. They they formed the shape of the country. You know, from your perspective, New York would be over here. New York was lit, and like some of these other ones. But like I said, parts of the South were totally unlit. They were just stars, star shapes, but black, empty. And that feels symbolic, too. And I think that's it. Um, yeah, it was pretty wild. See, I'm just looking here. Okay. Oh, that's it. Um, yeah. So comments on that are most welcome. And now I'll tell you about the dream I had the night before that, which was also, woo, so out there, so out there. Oh, this is a long note. Okay, let's see. Um, it was kind of a multi-part dream. It started, it started in my first apartment. Um, after I moved out of the house after college, I I, I stayed at home in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the suburbs of Buffalo, until I finished going to the University of Buffalo. And then I got my first apartment in, like, close to my family's house um, on a street called Linwood in North Tonawanda, New York. And I stayed there for five years. And it was uh, it was fine. It was it was comfortable enough. Um, and in this dream, I was I had bought that house and I was living in it so I could fully rent out my current house here in the city, both apartments, to, I guess, make more money, even though I wouldn't do that in real life. Um, so, and then um, the two-parter of that dream was back at the house that I grew up in. I grew up in a house on a street called Stenzel, S-T-E-N-Z-I-L, Stenzel Street. And um, in the dream, I think I was back in high school because my mom was also in the dream going in and out of the kitchen into the garage, which were connected. It seemed like summer. I was reading a Kurt Vonnegut book that doesn't exist. And Kurt Vonnegut, um, I've read a lot of his books, and I, and I refer to him often. I love his uh, humor. He's he's kind of, um, there's something very, very recognizably human about his writing. The tone is always, um, you feel you feel him through the tone of every book that he writes. And he, he comes across like a friend. Uh, that's what I like about his writing and something I've, I've tried to embrace in my own writing. That conversational tone so you feel like, feel like you're having a conversation or, or more than just like reading someone who's trying to be smart, even though he was very smart. And um, so I'm reading a, uh, a book by Kurt Vonnegut that doesn't exist, but it was written like a scholarly religious text. And so it had like old school language, like maybe even, maybe it was written partly in Latin and the type, the pages were fairly sizable, but some of the type was like really tiny and some of it was like um it would have windows of like kind of like color like there would be like a text box of purple and then that text would be within it and then there'd be other text outside of the purple it almost looked like like how you see some religious texts like sometimes the colors within um like a bible are kind of ornate if they go to the bother of a special printing job i don't know do they do that or like, you know, like the, the first letter of the sentence is really uh, large, like, um, and kind of gold. And then, you know, it trickles into the, the rest of the text, things like that. And um, it, like I said, the, the text was so small, I, I almost needed glasses, glasses. And, excuse me, the book was presented as a conversation about how to solve the problem of life or the secret of life, or the answer to life. And the plot was that it was a debate, a debate among three scholars. So three scholars are featured in the book, and the book promised on like the back cover description that the best idea from among the three scholars would be, be, would be presented at the end of the book as the solution to the problem of life, the issue of life or the challenge. And one scholar out of the three was of the light. 
and the two others were of shade or varying shade. So the book was kind of mysterious. Like, uh, who would have the answer to life? The, the scholar purely of light or the one of the less light filled scholars. And I found the book tough to read because of the old ornate language. And, um, I decided as I often do in real life to skip to the end of the book <laughs> and work my way back and see if the end of the book justified reading the rest of the book, which I actually think is not a bad way of reading a book to each their own. So the, and the end chapter was clearer than the, the first chapter I read. And it said that after much debate, the three scholars had chosen a joint shared name to present a joint shared idea. And it was an ornate name. And when I woke up, I remember it being kind of like Leviticus, but it wasn't. But that's as close as I can come to it. And, um, you know, like, or, you know, I don't even want to guess at it. Something similar to Leviticus. They had that kind of rhythm to it and, and maybe that number of syllables or one more. So they presented their joint idea as under a joint name. And they were in agreement as one. And what they said was that the answer to life was the recipe for an incredible soup. An incredible soup. And when I got to the end, it's as if the book almost had like secret pockets or secret dimensional pockets because there was a huge bag of soup available when you got to the end of the book. And I mean like big and it was kind of like in this um sturdy see-through plastic bag like very thick and i held it up and i could see through all the ingredients and um even while it was sealed it smelled incredible and right off the top i recognized like curry and paprika and garlic and um, oregano and these are um, spices that I like to cook with a lot when I make seafood I've been cooking a lot of seafood lately frying it quick in a frying pan and the entire bag was vegetarian there were um, at the bottom like there were beans and greens and sprouts lentils um, you name it lemon um you know there and all the different and other different colors too like a, maybe a tomato like and it was all swirling around and like you could see you could just like see how good it was it's hard to explain it further than that but it was almost like just so, sort of swirling in the bag it was like a grab bag of the essence of the earth um in food and um, the book apparently was from the public library so when I looked at the soup bag it was dated a couple years like old like like you know open in 2021 20, or whatever expiration date but I had the sense that you could open it and it would still be good and I noted to myself how interesting it was that apparently many people had checked out and read this book before me, but no one stole the bag of soup. No one, no one opened it. So I guess what you needed to do was write down, you know, what the recipe was for the soup and make it yourself. And the book said that the soup was especially good in winter because of the lemon. Just, that just stuck out and I thought about opening it but I didn't I just sort of marveled at how incredible it it appeared it was exotic and um, I was reading the book while sitting on the downstairs toilet <laughs> 
next to the kitchen. And when I finished and I got out of the restroom and I went to the kitchen, my mom was at the stove cooking a huge pot of soup. So, and she was younger. So there you go. So I thought that was kind of cool, like a cool ending for her to be making the soup at the end. I don't know if she was making that soup, but she was making a soup. So we'll presume that uh, she was making the soup. Um, so then I, I wrote about this to my mom, and she wrote, oh, man, this is interesting. Look up Leviticus. Isn't that biblical? She said, and she wrote, me like soup. We, we joke like that sometimes. If it can cure a cold, it can fix the world. <laughs> um, so then I did look up Leviticus. And um, since the three scholars decided to write under that name in the book of Leviticus per Wikipedia is uh, Latin, is the third book of the Torah and of the Old Testament, also known as the third book of Moses. Many hypotheses presented by scholars as to its origins agreed that it developed over a long period of time, reaching its present form during the Persian period from 538 to 332 BC, though this is disputed. Most of its chapters consist of Yahweh's speeches to Moses, which he tells Moses to repeat to the Israelites. So, um, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not a, I'm not a Bible pusher, um, but I just find that most religious texts seem to have some, um, sacred knowledge in them and, and then other parts that are less, um, maybe pure because all of these texts were written by human beings who are fallible. I think that some religious texts have parts that are, were inspired by by real people and real events and maybe real miracles but um, I don't I don't suggest ever that any religious text is the whole truth of existence um, and as many of you know who have watched me a while I'm, I'm not a fan of organized religion generally not the way it's currently being practiced and that's why I think that so many people are identifying more with being spiritual than being religious um, as they seek meaning in life. So, but it's interesting that the book, this book supposedly by Kurt Vonnegut, did seem like a kind of um, religious text in its presentation, yet it was, um, um, and it had a sacred message to it, but then again, then, then it had the kind of very simple, um, grounded answer like the answer to life was the most delicious soup of the earth you know like implying that everything that you would need here is is natural and of the earth and from the ground and you just have to pluck it and put it together and let it nourish you or something along those lines. So, um, yeah, I thought that was pretty neat. It, it had a, it had a lot of energy to it, the dream, both of the dreams. Um, so much so that it reminded me of something that some of the other psychics have said when they dream where the dream feels like it's something that happened to you as opposed to being a dream. And it's not something like I would never come up with this concept on my own. That's why I know it comes from outside of me. Like, why would I ever? Yeah. So it, that's where the mystery is in the dreaming or the, or where, you know, it's probably, it probably is a message of some form um, from spirit or, you know, greater forces. Um, it was a very positive dream. And um, so that's that. Your comments are most welcome. Um, both those dreams, all those dreams were just like, whew, so far away. I say it all the time that I feel very far away in some of those dreams. And I was reflecting on something that Kim Carey said recently in one of her videos where she had a dream of like at the end of her life leaving Earth and like sort of like waving goodbye to Earth as 
as she was traveling away from it in space. And excuse me, I was thinking about this last night too, like that even through hard times, um, if it's possible to, to like still appreciate where you are, to appreciate what you have, like that gratitude does go a long way. Um, cause like, I, I would say that like, I, you know, my life at this particular point in time, it's not like super duper exciting, but it's good enough. You know, it could be a fallow period before another period, but, um, cause you never know, but like things are not super exciting. Um, but they're good enough. And like, I'm kind of just taking stock of that. And I think maybe that's one of the lessons we're supposed to be picking up on through COVID. And, and sometimes only you can only really kind of arrive at that kind of understanding of things by living long enough and living through enough struggles to where like, at least if you're comfortable and there's peace and you know, you got your, you got your favorite cat with you like I do right now, you know, and squirrels and birds out on the porch and in the tree. Like it's, it's, it's enough. Um, it's enough. So that's my soapbox and I'll get off and, uh, I think I'm going to go swimming now. Have a little more coffee and go swimming. So have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks for tuning in. I will, I will do a book reading soon. Um, I promise. I promise. Okay. So comments most welcome. Um, let me know what would be in your soup of life. <laughs> okay. Take care. Bye.